The following episode of All Insights was recorded Tuesday, 10th September at 11 a.m. UK time. These really are unprecedented times, and I think, I think this uh, this saturation of shorts right now is partly because the market is spooked. Um, the demand side narratives are just not helping, and the supply side narratives keep they keep taking us on a roller coaster as of recently. Hello everyone and welcome to the fifth episode of Oil Insights. I'm your host Vincent Wu, Research Associate at Onyx Capital Advisory and I'm joined today by my research colleague Mira Chattavedi. Before we start the show, please like and subscribe to the podcast. I invite you to also visit Onyx's LinkedIn and YouTube channels for more interesting and exciting content. As oil traders and industry executives descend in Singapore this week, lower oil prices are certainly set to cloud over the spectacle that is RPEC. In the first week of September, the oil market capitulated as crude prices fell to their lowest level this year. The market is struggling to find reasons to be bullish and Brent Futures is staring down the $70 barrel. As the Northern Hemisphere summer comes to a close, flat prices seeing considerably bearish headwinds. Geopolitical risk is in the rearview mirror for now. Weak economic data from the US and China have weighed on sentiment, and it is becoming increasingly clear that China is not providing the oil demand growth that bulls have forecasted and have pinned their hopes on. The last week was really notable as price action tumbled further. Prices collapsed as a potential deal to restore Libyan oil supply brought back the focus on demand concerns. In light of this now, OPEC, in the words of Javier Blas, has kicked the can down a very uphill road, agreeing to delay planned increases of oil production for at least two months to December, where crucially the outcome of the US elections and OPEC plus compensation plans will be known. All of this and more will be discussed in this episode. So, now it's not just the Brent price that has sold off, but also its correlating structure and time spreads as well. So, uh, Mita, could you uh, tell us what you've been seeing in this? Uh, yes, of course. So, um, just to recap a bit of what you've described, Brent um, has been really weak. So, just looking at the NOV futures, the flat price, um, it just yesterday almost briefly dipped below $71 a barrel before coming back up. And it seems really comfortable around the $71 handle. Um, but this weakness has been seen in time spreads as well. So the front month time spread, that is the NOV deck time spread, on 3rd September alone, we saw it half from $0.80 cents a barrel to $0.40 cents a barrel. Um, since then, it has risen to $0.50 cents and seems a bit more like, like it's going to stay there. But uh, things are still sentiment is still bearish and we've seen this across the forward curve which um for instance we spoke in our futures report yesterday that even that the entire forward curve shifted lower week on week and even in tenors such as nov 2025 um flat price weakened by over four dollars a barrel by on a flat price basis so things are really weak in the futures market and connecting that Connecting this flow to the North Sea market, we have shifted from all the bull plays and the bids that we saw just two weeks, 10 days ago, to offers in the market. And for instance, yesterday's window saw a major offering 40s across the curve, um, while another trade house offered more prompt months of ECOFISC. Seems like the physical weakness have uh, caught up with the wider weakness in futures, um, especially interesting as the physical market had wedded previous sell-offs, um, especially with the differentials holding up above $2 um, towards the end of, end of August, yet the October Brent futures expiry was much weaker than expected, right? So, and with the expectation of more US crude um, arriving into Northwest Europe, as well as, you know, um, a bearish demand in Asia, because with 40s has traditionally been uh, seen as the uh, marginal barrel for exports to Asia and with uh, bearish sentiment um, in, in with Chinese demand, of course, that would uh, dampen demand in the North Sea physical market as well. So it just seems a case of um, weaker, weaker physical sentiment finally catching up and the market is just being better supplied, whereas previously there were some localised uh, 
uh, tightness in the prompts, for example, with the Libya situation. So I would like to mention that the product of this week is LPG and happens to be one of her favorites meter. And fair enough, we will of course link this to uh, gasoline demand as well as China's growing role in this market. And so meter will expand further on these developments later in the podcast, so stay tuned. Uh, back to crude futures. So the CFTC uh, money manager positioning has been getting critical attention from the industry with analysts and traders well aware that hedge funds are theoretically max short in the crude futures benchmarks, yet prices are still getting shorter. So Mira, can you uh, take us through the changes in the positioning over the past uh, few weeks? Yes, of course. Just like with, it's one of those things where you're max short until you go shorter. And we've seen that with the CFTC um, for the week and with the CFTC data for the week ending 3rd of September. Uh, so in both Brent and WTI, we saw ma managed by money players turn to really bearish positioning. Uh, for instance, taking both futures together, total long positions in the two crude futures declined by 8.3% week on week, while shorts increased by over 49% this week. This was very much WTI driven with WTI futures alone seeing longs decline by 12% while shorts increased by 122% just in the week ending 3rd of September. Uh, so Brent futures also saw money managers becoming more short, but um, it, it was just nowhere near as like the change, the week on week change was just a lot more significant in WTI futures. So it seems like the market getting sure that that was very much concentrated in WTI, there was still a lot of uh, room for that. So where does this leave us on the long to short ratio? Mm -hmm. uh, so in WTI, the managed by money long short ratio moved from the 70th percentile to the 20th, it, it dropped week on week from that to the 20th percentile to, so that is a decline from 680 to one to 265 to one just in one week. Um, Interestingly, so this is um, when I talk about percentiles, that's for all weeks from 2013. Um, interestingly, producers merchant were more bullish in WTI this week. Uh, we saw them um, declining their shorts by 4.5% while increasing their long positions by uh, just under 2%. But this change was still not enough to shake off the feeling that sentiment was really bearish in WTI given the significant increase in money managed shorts this week. Um, in Brent, speculative net length is really low at the 24.9 million barrels. Um, it has been lowered a few weeks ago in, in the beginning of August, but that doesn't change just that the fact that this is also really short right now. Um, for the long short ratio in Brent specifically, it's at 140 to 1, which is currently under the first percentile for all weeks since 2013. Looking at um, keep, so I know we're talking about crude, but just also uh, looking at key benchmark products and just like CFTC data on this. Um, for instance, ICE gas oil was also really bearish. We saw net positioning decline to negative 38.7 million barrels, its lowest value since January 2016. So we really are in a bearish regime like no other seen this year, in my opinion, and which with everything just testing the so-called max short level. Yeah, that's, that's, that's quite interesting. Um, the, the net positioning's shortest in almost a decade and definitely the most short since the COVID period. I guess it means that we need to get our masks uh, back out again. Um, yes, so exactly. We're pretty much at the lowest levels of all time, yet the market keeps on finding ways to get shorter. And as you mentioned, in gas oil futures, the short positions keep on uh, keep piling on, and that would be the same in heating oil futures too. So one has to wonder uh, if Brent falls below 70, what the money manager positioning might look like. Will net positioning fall below zero? Uh, will it become negative? Um, we are in unprecedented territory and a common theme is clear that there's been a lot more uh, short positions coming in um, from money managers. So yeah, Mita, why do you think there's such a proliferation of shorts at the moment? Um, that's a really good question. So just like the first part of what you said, I don't think Brent's going to necessarily dip to sub-zero in net positioning. Although it is interesting how that is a genuine concern right now. This, these really are unprecedented times. And I think, I think this, uh, this saturation of shorts right now is partly because the market is spooked. Um, the demand side narratives are just not helping and the supply side narratives keep Taking us into uh, keep taking us on a roller coaster as of recently, um, bringing us to the elephant in the room, 
OPEC plus. <laughs> uh, I mentioned a few episodes ago that I don't see any news on OPEC plus supply in Q4 being good for the market because, and I think we saw that happen. OPEC first completely terrified the market on um, grounds of that they're going to bring supply back online and um, with demand being so poor, everyone sort of, everyone got really bearish suddenly. There was sell-off, there was a massive sell-off in Brent and even after OPEC confirmed that they weren't going to do so, I think that just confirms what we were all scared of with demand not being good enough to meet, meet that level of supply. Um, I mentioned a few episodes ago that I don't see any news on OPEC plus supply in uh, Q424 being good for the market. I, OPEC first completely terrified the market on by with rumors that they're going to bring barrels back online. And even after they said that they will not do so, I think they just confirmed what everyone sort of knew to begin with, that the demand just isn't there to meet any of this extra supply. We have really bearish um, economic and industrial data coming out of vital economies like Germany and especially China right now. Um, even in the US, labor market data has been really shifty. We saw Joel's data, that's the job openings and labor turnover survey report coming out highlighting a cooling labor market uh, just on a month on month basis and uh, weekly jobless claims declined um, last in the week ending 31st of August but which is good but at the same time NFP data that is non-farm payroll data came out weaker than expected as well last Friday and we saw a decline in full-time jobs mm -hmm. so there just isn't enough to indicate that there is demand for all of the supply, all of this volatility that we're seeing surrounding supply. Mm -hmm. And um, I think this can also be seen, I think this shift in sentiment and just like testing of Max Short can also be seen in CTA positioning right now. Have you seen anything about that specifically? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, um, CTAs have um, been playing a massive role in the market. And um, the Onyx model has been showing that CTAs have been the most uh, at the most short since uh, since March 2020 peak COVID, um, positions fell below, uh, fell to minus 200k lots across the five main oil futures benchmarks. It's significant because previous sell-offs in the last two years at the bottom was minus 170k, so the recent sell-off um, breached that level. So it's also said that some funds are deploying this so-called crisis alpha into commodities like oil, looking to latch onto um, opportunities in the event of uh, further sell-offs, such as you know uh, like a risk asset sell-off or that was triggered by like a bearish uh, uh, non-farm payroll supports. So our latest poll was uh, our latest LinkedIn poll was about whether. Uh, we will hear from OPEC given the downward gyrations in the price action and indeed last week's huge sell-off uh, did force the producer group's hand and in the virtual meeting last Thursday it was confirmed that they announced they've agreed to delay the production increase until December and indeed OPEC have exercised their optionality as reiterated by uh, Saudi Energy Minister Prince Abdulaziz in a virtual conference a couple months back. So, yeah, Mita, what do you make of OPEC's uh, recent actions? I think it's, um, so just before that LinkedIn poll, I think we all agreed that no news from OPEC was good news for now. And given everything that's happened ever since, uh, I stick to that. Um, we've seen this avalanche of bearishness just on the back of mixed signals from OPEC. But as for the decision itself, OPEC would likely want to increase supply for market share reasons, but at the cost of oil slipping below $70 a barrel, um, perhaps not. What do you think? Yeah, it's, uh, it is it's interesting. Like OPEC are in quite the predicament with the recent, uh, recent trends in prices, and it is for the producer group ultimately a battle between market share and revenue. Um, of course, we are rapidly approaching a critical point and indeed the, recently the Wall Street banks as well as, you know, the pulse from RPEC uh, it's saying that trade houses are downgrading their forecasts for crude. So OPEC are in quite the predicament and it's ultimately a battle between market share and revenue. Price action is on the downwards trend and we are rapidly approaching a critical point. Seems like there has been a paradigm shift in sentiment and Wall Street banks have downgraded their forecasts as well as uh, major trade houses um, 
having the same notion uh, in this week's uh, RPEX events. Um, people seem to be readying for a lower flat price environment. So expectations of delayed OPEC cuts and monetary easing, so interest rate cuts, may be interpreted as a confirmation of economic weakness. So that's bearish news. And of course, the Saudis have been voluntarily, voluntarily cutting for just about a whole year now. And all the while, US shale producers are saying thank you very much for the higher prices. And so the OPEC very much loves to talk about uh, unity and Recently, there has been a few high-level engagements, for example, uh, OPEC Secretary General visiting uh, Kazakhstan and Iraq, um, as well as a recent meeting between the Saudi and Iraqi foreign ministers in Baghdad. So with that in mind, uh, whether the countries Russia, Iraq and Kazakhstan make good of their compensation uh, cuts and compliance uh, plans will be crucial for the market's perception of stability and unity, as well as credibility, um, because if the current trend goes on, what's stopping the, uh, the Saudis from utilising their spare capacity and opening the gates, you know, similar to you know, uh, the, uh, what's happened back in March 2020. So we would also like to bring to attention OPEC's various methods of communication because, of course, as you mentioned, Mita, um, if they are silent, that's good news, that also means something and whatever the announcements, that's also something to be interpreted. And they understand the media game very well, and at least in our world and the oil industry, um, their words are the oil equivalent of every single word that Jerome Powell might say. OPEC has, can uh, test the market, and of course, with a lot of headlines coming up from Bloomberg or Reuters, algos might trade off the back of that. So in the absence of direct communication, the market was left with media reporting from anonymous sources, first at there were no plans to delay uh, the production production cuts. Then last Tuesday or Wednesday, following the sell-off, sources close to OPEC also told the media that there were plans to delay the supply increases, followed by an official uh, confirmation on Thursday. So it does awfully seem like this uh, narrative ping pong and OPEC are doing uh, whatever it takes to prevent the flat price falling below 70. So after the sell-off, that really forced uh, their hand. So yeah, Mita, what are your thoughts on the OPEC's uh, communication methods in light of recent events? Um, I completely agree with you. I think from what I said earlier about no news from OPEC being good news, um, I agree, but at the same time, OPEC's not really been quiet, even without having official statements come out. They have done so much, for example, this year to keep rice from sliding off from bullish reports to just do in general, just trying to make sure that the headlines keep showing some form, their, their headlines keep showing some form of resilience in the oil market, just to keep prices from completely sliding off. And you're right, OPEC headlines do carry a lot of weight in the oil market, and they understand this very, very well. They've told the market in advance that the exact amount of supply that they were going to inject, hoping that everyone would price this in in time and everything would be fine, even though they're injecting more supply into the market. Um, but bullish OMR or not, the demand just isn't there. And I think that finally was reflected in their previous, in their most recent oil market report as well, where they finally acknowledged China's uh, economy slowing down and that being, that possibly meaning that demand would take a hit in the oil, in the oil narrative. Yeah, so I think that is just more important than any narrative that they might want to show. But I agree with you. I think, they, I think they're think they really good at the media game. And even with just how they've announced like ev everything that's happened in the past week, I think it's really interesting that they first had multiple sources sort of whispering like rumors of how, um, of, an, of them putting supply back online rather than having an outright statement. Because if the market reacted well, they could come out with a proper statement just confirming that. But the f if it didn't, which is what we saw happen, they officially say that they plan to do otherwise or postpone it, which is exactly what happened. So I think they do understand how to see how the market would react really well. And I think they know how to sort of nudge it really well as well. Mm, for sure. I mean, their next official meeting is in uh, December, but of course the decisions about uh, whether to extend these production cuts will be made before then. So of course, the next two months will be quite interesting to see uh, what they do, how they communicate. 
So now turning on to uh, the product of the week, uh, we will discuss the LPG market, which is slightly more niche, but an integral part of the oil market. So firstly, Mita, uh, we have uh, spoken about butane being exceptionally strong recently. So do you think this might be linked to uh, like a hedging flow by gasoline blenders ahead of the winter spec uh, specification change? A short, on long answer short, yes, I completely agree. Um, but just it's, it's just really interesting that you've mentioned US butane being strong and just butane being strong. Because in the US specifically, it's been weaker recently. Um, but the strength that we saw before this current weakness was, in my opinion, because of gasoline hedging. Uh, so butane has seen random bouts of strength on the back of uh, first petrochemical, just uh, petrochemical demand. And now I think we're now that especially everyone in gasoline is just done with summer, with just how summer driving season was and everything, everyone is shifting to winter spec gasoline especially as we approach closer into Q4 tenors. Um, so that definitely is driving up beauty and demand. Um, but yes, yeah, so it's interesting that it has come off recently though. So no US normal beauty strengthened at the end of August, um, but weakened from, so it was at 50, uh, 0 0.5 cents, a cents per gallon on the 2nd of September, and currently it's uh, 0 0.10 cents per gallon. Um, this is as of yesterday again. Um, so things have been, slightly weaker. It, they've also been weaker compared to US propane that's also been really weak due to limited domestic demand and just weaker arms between the US and international propane. Uh, but we now see the butane versus propane differential also weakening in the US. Yeah, so why do you think it's got gotten so much weaker in recent uh, weeks? So um, this current weakness I think is a market correction because butane got really high. Uh, but it is interesting to note that if butane keeps getting expensive again, it is going to be hard to keep to have to see that demand from gasoline blenders, especially with gasoline not being at, at its strongest right now. Um, exactly. So we might see levels of demand destruction. Um, gasoline blenders are already making little on margins um, this season, and there have been reports of butane buyers in the New York Harbor buying as little as possible and trying to like sort of delay purchasing as more as much as they can despite winter coming close and despite them having to switch soon into winter specification gasoline. Um, I've also seen reports of um, the, of other players use because of the high butane prices shifting to or speaking about shifting to light virgin naphtha instead. So those two products butane and light virgin naphtha are different chemically but if butane keeps getting more expensive we might see more blenders choose to switch. Interesting. So yeah, we tend to see the switch between uh, naphtha and propane more uh, prominent than naphtha versus butane per se. So that is uh, an interesting observation. So just on this topic, we do see international propane surging recently, especially in Asia, where the Asian benchmark, the FIST and index, the FEI, propane has been really strong, um, yet that it has been contrasted with the weak China demand story. So we also cannot discount the impact of China's many PDH uh, propane dehydrogenation units starting up, which traders are saying it is really creating a paradigm shift in the NGL's market in terms of fundamentals. Um, is that pattern in line with what you're seeing in the uh, Asian benchmark, the FEI, as of late? Um, yes, so international propane has been really strong, and that has especially been seen in Far Eastern propane, that is FEI propane. Uh, so the front one, that is the Oct Nov. FEI time spread is currently at was at five dollars per metric ton yesterday. Um, I think it was at like the negative handles last month or a little before that. Um, and this strength has been through buying um, by Chinese players bids in the physical. Um, and again, as I mentioned, the R between the U.S. and international propane has been weaker, so that's also implying strength to international propane. Um, more PDH, propane dehydrogenation units coming up online, would be bullish for propane. Um, and that definitely, I think the paradigm shift comes from the fact that more, if more of more petrochemical players are using PDH, are starting up PDH units, um, then we might see just more demand for propane relative to naphtha. But um, I think it's also interesting because, um, again, like butane, Propane is also a lot more expensive. So um, 
FEI versus Moptree NAFTA, that is um, Far Eastern NAFTA, is currently in the positive handles. So ordinarily, we might have started seeing a lot of players switching to NAFTA right now because um, it's just cheaper to use. Um, and um, so for crackers, for example, I think they'd prefer to use NAFTA given it's cheaper at the, at the minute. But even flexible crackers, I think, take time to switch. It's not as easy. It's, it's not as easy as just seeing that they're going to switch now that propane is more expensive. Um, so I think just right for the short term, I do see FEI propane being a little more uh, strengthened. And with this PDH news coming up, as well, with more PDH units coming online, I think that strength should um, sustain for now. Um, adding to this, we also saw a bid f um, for transit through the Panama Canal, which is a really important route between the US and Japan. Um, surge up to $900,000 um, just a fort, I think, two weeks ago. Uh, so this is a level that's not, this is a level for a bid that's not been seen since May of this year. So because of this, the LST FEI differential, that is US propane versus FEI propane, also completely plummeted this week. Um, adding to this, we see tropical form Francine in the US. And if that turns into a hurricane, which a lot of people are forecasting that it will, we might see barrels trapped in the US, supply tightness in um, Asia, again, injecting more strength into FEI. So FEI looks like it's going to be strong in the short term, uh, despite being, say, more expensive than NAFTA, ideally, like, in another, usually a time where demand destruction should kick in. But because of all of these other factors, because of just the fact that even crackers are, even the most flexible crackers would take time to switch to NAFTA, I think FEI is just going to be strong for now. Yeah, so yeah, the the propane market it seems to be intimately linked to, uh, of course, not only supply and demand fundamentals, but also extreme weather events as well. Um, also trade flows between US and the Far East, US and China, all with all the fundamental stuff that's um, all super interesting. And we have noted that uh, there's been a lot of um, a lot of people going into these LPG contracts as of late. The open interest is far well beyond uh, five year average levels. So we suppose we're seeing a lot of speculative and hedging interest alike. And of course, uh, if you've been following the um, the LPG market recently, then you've been we've been seeing a lot lot stronger, uh, a lot higher volatility levels, which has of course led to more uh, trading opportunities, which we detail in our uh, research reports. Um, you can check these out. Um, so with that, we are near the conclusion of this podcast, and as usual, we finish off by peering into the crystal ball. So, uh, Mita, are you bullish or bearish, and why? Once in this podcast is history, I might be slightly bullish right now, just because um, I'm, I'm actually still positioned more neutrally in the medium term, uh, just because I still think the fundamental picture is just not that strong. That said, I don't think oil is necessarily going to drift below 70 right now. So just in the short term, I think it'd be hard to bearish right, hard to be bearish right now because of how concentrated short everyone is. Like we've joked a lot in this podcast about how you're max short until you're not but uh, given how short saturated every the, the market is, it's just it's really easy to see. We could just as easily see a reversal on the smallest bullish headline, or we could see these players taking profit. So I think I think because of all of that those factors, it's really hard for me to be bearish in the short term. Yeah, for sure. Uh, it does seem like uh, for um, for traders, it would be it's an a more clear-cut case of going long at 70 versus going long at uh, 80. And on my side, I do uh, remain bullish at current levels. I also don't think um, prices will fall below 70 in the near term. Of course, the significant presence of speculative short positions uh, cannot be understated, and market conditions would be primed for a reversal in the case of uh, bullish catalysts or such as geopolitical risk. Um, and if economic uncertainty and extra OPEC barrels have already been priced in, then the compensation cuts um, of the OPEC plus producers, Kazakhstan, Iraq and Russia, should they be successful, should the, um, that would really change the story of uh, supply and demand balances. And OPEC has not given up on supply management just yet. And at lower prices, you do have a bit of demand creation. And it's one of the few things that, the U that America and China can agree on, which is 
to buy crude oil at lower prices to fill up their uh, the stockpiles or the SPR in the US, and not to mention the feedstock demands for the pet chem industry, which has supported the NGL's natural gas liquids complex as of late, as you mentioned, um, Meta, about propane and butane. And that brings us to the end of this Oil Insights episode. So thank you everyone for tuning in. Any questions or thoughts, please do comment below. And as always, please smash the like button and subscribe to the channel. We will see you on the next episode.